We took freely available Landsat imagery and we developed this range-wide model that covers a vast spatial extent and a really wide temporal window to develop these fine scale maps of habitat suitability for an endangered species in an environment that's changing all the time. So I'm a research biologist slash project manager for the University of Idaho, and I work on this endangered Ridgeways rail in the southwestern United States. It's a species that needs attention. It is an indicator species of marsh condition throughout the whole Colorado River system. I know they're, they're a marsh bird, they're, they're like the size of a chicken, but they're high up the food chain in these marshes. And so if rails are doing well, it's indicative of a healthy system. So if we can develop products that help us manage marshes for the rails, it's also going to help protect habitats for other species. And we are really focusing on, okay, how do we take effective tools and apply them in space and time to maximize their benefit to the species? So we paired this spatially extensive on the ground sampling data with really extensive satellite imagery to develop range-wide habitat suitability models that can inform management actions uh, throughout the range of this species. We needed a product that was accessible, available, covered our area of interest, and our time frame of interest in Landsat really fit that perfectly for us. And we built this tool that is accessible to managers and they can view it and it's updated annually. So they'll have up-to-date predictions of habitat suitability throughout the entire range of the species so they can really focus in on the areas that need management, that don't need management, that perhaps need on the ground confirmation. It should be a powerful tool to more effectively and efficiently allocate limited resources to ideally one day get this species fully recovered. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Scott Roberts and uh, Kent Martin. And welcome to the 29th um, episode of On the Wing. And uh, Kent's got uh, uh, even more uh, viewer submissions, which is really cool. Um, Kent, I wanted to, uh, I, I was I was uh, near Eureka Springs. You've been up there, I'm sure. Plenty of times. Of times, yep, yep. Right? Okay, so there's something called the Basin Hotel. Now, right. Basin has a uh, is known as kind of like this haunted hotel. It's famous for being haunted. Okay, and I, I don't know how old the Basin is, but I'm sure it was old. built in late 1800s, something like that. Anyways, we're walking back uh, to um, my truck, and as I'm walking back, I'm looking up at the sky, and I see hundreds of buzzards flying around in a big circular pattern. Technically turkey uh, vultures. Is that what they are talking? Okay. Turkey vultures, right. they're not buzzards, they're turkey vultures. But yes, <laughs> people call them I buzzards. Did, I, but... I'm gonna send you some video of this uh, uh, to share maybe on the next show, but um, uh, they were perched up on the rooftop of the Basin Hotel and it looked like a scene out of a horror flick. I mean, yeah. it was. It was crazy. So. so I have real quick called up. Um, come on, give me the share button. It's not giving me the share. There it is. I've called up a picture of said Basin Park. Okay. The Basin and there Park it is. Hotel. There it is right there. Right. So you can yeah. imagine all, all you see on the, the uh, left side. That's, that's something you can see a lot better. 
they were just, I mean, they were just right next to each other, just lined up waiting. I don't know what died or whatever. I imagine that's what they were showing up for. There's another picture of it, you know, right. uh, They just may have been warming up. It was cool. You know, uh, Eureka Springs is a really cool town, you know, uh, oh yeah. Stop that share. They've seen it. A really cool, uh, white limestone cut hotel has a green patina, sort of a copper patina, you know, paint job. And, uh, uh, it's right next to the namesake Basin Park, uh, which is, here's a cool picture of it on Pinterest. Let's share that while we're at it. Sure. So people get an idea of what you're talking about. Where is that at? There it is right there. Did that share? There we go. There's a picture oh, of yeah, it. This from, yeah, there we go. There's a really cool picture of it. And, uh, you know, I've actually never been into it. Uh, they have one of our telescopes. Uh, they have a uh, Dom in there. 1045C oh, uh, really? on the rooftop for guests to use. Yep. Oh, so they have. You have uh, to remember that. Yep. I so, think uh, maybe you mentioned that to me before. Yeah. Tyler goes over once in a while and works on it for him because, they, you know, they left yeah, it out and a big windstorm came up and blew it over, but did not blow it, it off over. the roof. Uh, right. Over is better than blowing off that roof. So anyway, you want to go ahead and let's get started, shall we? Sure. So uh, we okay. missed last week. Uh, Scott was um, under the weather and uh, is right. back with us. So it was just, you know, he he's the uh, <clears throat> he's the wizard behind the black curtain but also in front of the black curtain. And it's more difficult to do this without him doing the setup. So we're going to launch into On the Wing. If we can make it go, come on, there we go. On the Wing, I still got to get some music on here. So we're going to start out with, uh uh-oh, the video of the uh, call. Scott, search real quick and find the call on YouTube if you could. So you can play it while we're looking at okay. a photo from Carl Bernhardt. This is Clark's. What is it? What is this? Clark's Bird? Nutcracker. A Clark's Nutcracker. Okay. On a uh, dead bristlecone pine branch in the White Mountains of California. You can see the range map. It's year round. Uh, it's a bird of the high mountains. Uh, this bird is a big bird. 11 to 12 inches long. Uh, closer to a crow than a robin. Uh, it is a big bird with a, sir. It's a big bird with a very stout bill. Uh, as we can see from the picture, they are pale gray uh, with black wings. Uh, in flight, the wings show large white patches along the trailing edge, uh, looking much like a, uh, uh, in, uh, somewhat like the big white patch on the red headed woodpecker. Um, I'm running the uh, YouTube video now. So if you listen. You don't have it wired in, do you? Well, I can share it. I, I, I'm going to have to unshare you. Yeah, unshare me real quick. I, sh- I stopped my share. You go ahead. While you're doing that, I'm going to keep talking. Uh, the tail is black in the center uh, with very broad white along either side. There it is. Did you share the sound or did you pull a Kent and not share the sound? I think you pulled a Kent and didn't share the sound. Here, here you go. Can you hear it? No. I don't think you shared the sound. All right. Hold on. That's, you went Kent on it. There we go. There we go. Scott, screw your screen up a little bit so you can see the bird.
And it has a very, very woodpeckery call. Okay, so the nutcrackers that we can see have black bills, black legs, and black feet. Uh, it's named Clark's Nutcracker by mm -hmm. Captain William Clark of William and Clark fame. They are uh, classified as a woodpecker. Uh, they're one of nine, uh, excuse me, one of five new bird species uh, collected during the William and Clark expedition through the Northwestern United States in the Louisiana Purchase. The other birds being the common poor wheel, the greater sage grouse, the interior least turn, and Lewis's woodpecker. Now, when I say five new bird species collected, I'm being very careful here because, you know, they didn't discover it. If you want to say they discovered it, they were discovered by the Western world, but the native uh, indigenous people knew of these birds. They were just described to the Western world uh, and they collected these specimens. And this is crazy. And reading up on this, in all, they described 122 animal species, including the grizzly bear, the coyote, the prairie dog, the jackrabbit, the mule deer, and the bighorn sheep. There's a whole bunch of others, obviously, uh, on that list of 122 things. But I found that very interesting. I Wait like a minute. To they, they described the coyote? Yes, the coyote had, had not been described before. Previously, the coyote was an animal of the uh, far west and the open plains and it had, it had not been described uh in 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 european american literature uh before they discovered they found them and described them uh on their journey and through the louisiana purchase wow i mean they literally went where no no and it done man, before <laughs> where no where no white man not even, not trying to be sure. racist but where <clears throat> no white man had gone before and no right. Westerner had gone there. And so they were describing, you know, all these animals they encountered along their way. I'm sort of surprised on the hindsight, I'm going, wow, 122. But I'm sort of surprised that that number is not frankly higher than that on hindsight. So, maybe, you know, maybe I, they I weren't, can, that wasn't really the thrust of their expedition, you know. No, exactly. But they were doing <clears throat> it anyway. You know, they were right. both great naturalists and outdoor people. The fact that they didn't and survived, and if you've never read about their travels and their winter stays, you know, oh. we aren't tough. You know, this is, you know, like trying to get to the South Pole or yeah. getting stuck in the Arctic ice for a winter. You know, I mean, this is, it was Tough's serious. From nowhere if, if you're in real trouble. Yeah, there's, yeah, you're, you're on your own and they were tougher than we are. I just, what it comes down to. So anyway, I get down rabbit holes every once in a while. I guess in this story, I get down jackrabbit holes if there are such things. Uh, so anyway, moving along with the Clark's nut hatch, uh, excuse me, nut cracker. They travel in large flocks, use their spike like bills to pick seeds out of pine cones. And this is important. They eat the seeds and bury thousands of others for winter use. They have a pouch under their tongue that stores a, a, a vast quantity of seeds for their long flights to hide their seeds. And they remember where those seeds are over the course of the winter. But here's the important part. Seeds they don't eat have a crucial role, crucial role in growing new pine trees. So without the Clark's Nutcracker, there are a forests of pine trees that would not exist. When they fly, they fly on broad uh, floppy wings and make rolling gravelly calls audible from a long ways away. Uh, so here's the, like I said, they're birds of the mountain. Uh, they are closely associated with pine trees, pine trees that produce large seed, such as the white bark and limber pine. But they're also found in other mountainous evergreen forests from 3,000 feet above sea level to more than 11,000 feet, always out in the West. White bark, limber, Colorado pinion, and single leaf pinion, as well as Southwestern white pines, rely on the nutcracker to disperse their seeds. 
This is shown by uh, the trees and the cones they produce, the shape of the trees and the cones, compared to cones that disperse their seeds by the wind. So they uh, have, eat these large seeds and they're adapted uh, to crack open those cones and spread those seeds. So there's a distinct difference between seeds that rely, uh, cones that rely on birds versus cones that rely on the wind to do their uh, uh, dispersal. The birds breed in early January and February. Uh, they feed their young stored seeds. Uh, and uh, in a typical, non-typical birding, uh, males develop a brood pouch on its chest and take turns incubating the clutch. Uh, this is not typical of the crow family, of which woodpeckers belong and nutcrackers, as uh, we have learned. So if you live in a habitat where these are, pine forest above 3,000 feet in the mountains west, uh, you can bring them to your feeders using uh, large seeds like peanuts, and they also will eat suet. I have eaten suet, and, you know, if I was starving to death, I would eat it, but preferably I just leave it for the birds. You so, don't like that, huh? It wasn't for, it's, wasn't for my palate. So uh, moving along, we're going to look at, there we go. We've looked at these birds before. Carl sent these beautiful pictures of... What is it? It's a male house finch feeding on a variety of privet hedge berries. Uh, so uh, took these in his uh, yard in Riverside, California, house finches. We did a deep dive into the difference between house finches and purple finches. This is almost certainly a house finch. It's 5.5, 5.1 uh, to 5.5 inches long. It's about the same size as a house sparrow, as we discovered before, discussed before. Uh, so difficult to differentiate between the two. Males have rosy red on their face and upper chest, with streaks of red on their belly and back. Uh, that describes this bird. Their diet uh, it uh, can cause a wide range of coloration between individuals. Uh, I'm going to guess that this bird is brighter red than most because it's uh, gorging on purple berries, which would cause its coloration to turn redder. Uh, they gather in groups at feeders and perch in nearby trees. Uh, when cracking seeds, they sit still and crush it using rapid bites of their powerful beaks. This species uh, will feed on the ground, eating plant stalks and searching for seeds. Uh, like most finches, their flight is a bouncy one as they move through the hair, through the hair, through the air, their habitat encompasses a wide range of open areas, farms, forests, edges, parks, and yards. So we got a few more pictures here from Carl. Uh, Carl is digging back into his uh, archives and sending me lots of photos. We'll be seeing lots of Carl's photos. And uh, for okay. those of you who are watching, we can see your photos are, here too. Are you uh, sharing your these photos? Did, did I not get the share up? You did oh, we're share. just watching me talk, huh? That's exciting. <laughs> we're watching you talk. <laughs> Boy. There it sounded we go. good, though. You're very illustrative. There so we let's, go. Let's I, I, was painting, I was painting a picture well you for are. you. Yeah. Right, there we go. There's, there's the bird on the male house finch feasting on privet berries. Some variety of privet was not able to identify which one. A lot of people call this hedge. Technical name of it is privet. Uh, it matched a couple. Of, it was very difficult to look. And because head species um, tend to be uh, scattered around the country, they're not just isolated. Most privet hedge is an invasive species from China, if I remember correctly. Uh, but they produce, um, some varieties produce these big bunches of seeds that look somewhat like bunches of grapes. And as we can tell, tell from the beak of this male he's been waylaying those purple berries here he is uh, doing his best to attract uh, circus performance might go off with the traveling circus as he hangs upside down on his tra flying trapeze to find his next privet berry meal and here's a female doing the same thing females are 
basic, simple drab brown birds with white streaking. And, you know, and there's just not a whole lot to uh, these said birds. So we're going to move along to, I think we've talked about, we, we did this before. I meant to get a nice picture of the cedar waxwing. This is a picture I took of a mixed flock of cedar waxwings, robin and other birds at Lake Fort Smith State Park in Arkansas. Uh, there, this is area is borders on the year round to non breeding area. Uh, generally, I see cedar waxwings in the fall and spring, uh, traveling in large flocks. They're very uh, noisy birds, uh, but they're very, very quiet. So we'll talk about it and then we'll listen a little bit to, to uh, uh, the recording I took with my uh, smartphone. They're five and a half to six and a half, in, half inches long, uh, medium, medium sized. Boy, my, my speaker is not working today. Uh, sleek birds, large head, short neck, wide, short bill. Uh, they have a crest that often lies flat or droops over the back of their head. Uh, the wings are broad and pointed like a starling's. The tail is short and square tipped. The birds are pale brown on the head and chest, fading into a soft gray on the wings. The belly is pale yellow and the tail is gray with a bright yellow tip. Some birds in the Northeast sport orange tails because they eat berries that are in, in, an introduced species of honeysuckle. The biggest uh, feature I think on the cedar waxwing is its face is covered with a narrow black mask uh, that is outlined in white, very striking. Uh, think uh, the Lone Ranger sort of look on a bird and that's sort of what it's like and they have uh, waxy secretions on the tips of uh, the wing feathers that is not easy to see. I couldn't see any on these birds. Uh, let's, they're, they're social birds and travel in large flocks year round. Uh, they sit in fruiting trees, swallowing berries whole and pluck them in midair with a beef, bleef, huh, brief fluttering hover. Uh, mm -hmm. they also, uh, will go over water and catch insects, uh, and they're described as flying like tubby, clumsy swallows. Uh, they love fruit, uh, thus they can be attracted to the yard, native berries, producing trees, shrubs, dogwood, service berry, cedar, which these birds are feeding on, juniper and hawthorn and winterberry are some. So let's listen to these birds, if I can get it to, here we go. Turn your sound up, it's very quiet. So I'm not gonna talk during this uh, so you can hear it. So go ahead and turn your sound up real quick. So I don't, we don't blow you out. Okay, here we go. Okay, now you've had time to turn your sound down. I hope you could hear that, that real high-pitched trill. That was the bird. You can also hear uh, robins in there. And a couple of times there's a trill, uh, a sound of a woodpecker. Uh, never could find it. Not sure what it was. But uh, that's what they sound like, really high-pitched. But when you hear them, there's a whole bunch of them, and they all have that really high-pitched uh, sound. Uh, here's something interesting I found. You know, parasitic cowbirds, uh, brown cowbirds, uh, lay their eggs in nests of other birds, and their chicks grow faster and are bigger 
than the other songbirds and so uh, end up uh, through starvation or push them out of the other uh, chicks out of the nest. Uh, brown cowbirds will, and we do have some pictures of some brown cowbirds we're going to have in a future episode. Brown cowbirds will lay their nests in uh, cedar wax or lay their eggs in cedar wax wings. However, the chicks die because of the high fruit diet uh, that cedar wax wings uh, feed their nestlings. Uh, cowbirds can't survive on. So they end up not being a parasitic that grows to adulthood. And I find this interesting as well. Uh, many of the berries they eat will ferment and uh, alcohol is not good for, thing for these birds like for people uh, who overconsume. Cedar wax wings get drunk and even die from alcohol poisoning. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I thought that was uh, very entertaining uh, might be entertaining to see drunk cowbirds. I have seen drunk deer before. Uh, on the farm, there's uh, three pear trees that produce pears, and the pears will hit the ground and ferment, and the deer will eat the fermented pears, and literally, they stand there and look at you like a drunk would, and you can walk up to them, and they'll stagger around and, and try and run off, and they will fall down and just sort of Good lay boy. there. And it's, it's uh, you know, I, I need to try and get that on video at some point because it is, I hate to laugh at the drunken expense of cedar wax and wings and, yeah, uh, right. and deer, but it is somewhat humorous. All right. Uh, you look for these uh, in birds in woodlands of all kinds, farms, orchards, suburban gardens, uh, anywhere there are free trees or shrubs within their area, obviously. Uh, they were just gorging on the berries on these uh, uh, cedar trees. Uh, I went out the next morning to try and take better video and get better pictures. And the flock had moved on to uh, more fruit filled pastures. So mm. I also got pictures. Again, this is taken through a pair of binoculars and my smartphone. Uh, you can see two Dark eyed junco up there. So uh, I took my cue from Andrew Corkle, I think it was, who uh, got pictures of some house sparrows through his eight by forty two or ten by forty two binoculars. Oh, there's a lot of them. Yeah, there's there's more birds. There's these two up here. It's like there's more birds and leaves. <laughs> and there's there's some other birds know. back in there. There's some chickadees. We'll see a chickadee here in a minute. Anyway, these birds are dark, dark eyed juncos. We covered them oh, a month, month and a half ago. Here we go. Let's listen to the black eyed or dark eyed junco. Can you hear that, Scott? Or did I, can you I hear that? I hear it. Nope. See? I pulled a kent. You and I both forgot to share the sound. Right, here we go one more time. There you go. Now the video, you may not be able to read it. It says, play these sounds near your window and you will attract these birds closer to you. They will come to the sound of the bird. And there's a interesting um, comment from Martin Eastburn. He says, when he was a kid of four, he had to protect some, uh, protect some robins after they ate uh, py pyracantha berries. Pyracantha, uh, right. Yep. Orange yeah, berries. Fermented, and he had to keep the cats from attacking the birds as they could not fly. So I wonder if the, I wonder if the cats <laughs> ate enough birds that they would get drunk too. But yeah, I mean, it happens. Pyracantha has an, if I remember correctly, uh, is a uh, red berry, really uh, dark green leaves, a nice bushy sh shrub. Um, in fact, I think that people who live north of me have some pyracantha. But, you know, uh, and, and we learn new things about Beatrice Hines all the time. This weekend, it's Bird Count Weekend here in Belgium. It's organized by, uh, looks like Nature Punth. Uh, an, organ, organ, an organization for nature preserve 
I've been a board member for the, this organization in my region. So good Fantastic. for you, Beatrice. That's awesome. Scott, I and also gonna, a volunteer. I thought you were going to say she likes to eat pyracantha berries and get drunk. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought you were going with that. Uh, sorry, I made a joke at your expense, Beatrice, but oh. it was it was a good one or a bad one, bad dad joke. How about yeah. that? So and I'm, uh Kent, you are now sharing your word uh word document. Word document, yeah. I uh, you know, I do know a lot of this, but I keep a word document so I don't forget what I'm doing. A PowerPoint episode, share sound. There we go. All right, so there we go. I like to make notes, although one week I could not find my notes and did it off the top of my head. And I don't know if it was somebody commented, uh, made a comment in email afterwards. They were, they were, I just, I got lucky. There were birds I knew. So, and could talk about sometimes they get lucky. Sometimes I don't. So anyway, as y'all could read on my screen there for a while, they're 5.5 to 6.5 inches long. Uh, they're significantly smaller than a Robin. Robins become Robins and crows become really comparison birds because I think they're birds that everybody sort of knows. Uh, they forage on the ground, hopping around in search of uh, forage in forest lawns and other open areas. Uh, breeds in coniferous forests or mixed coniferous forests. Uh, there was a flock of them here feeding on the grass strip outside in the parking lot a couple of weeks ago. Uh, their song is a high chip note, as we heard. We can listen again. That's a trill, not a chip note. Variety of sounds there. Uh, there are more than 15 described races. Six are easily recognizable. The slate colored in Eastern and much of Canada uh, which this is going to be a slate colored. Uh, Oregon with a dark hood, warm brown back and rufous flanks found in western U.S. The white winged and peak sided in the Rockies and Great Western Plains or Western Great Plains and yellow eyed, red eyed and gray headed of the Southwest. So that is a dark eyed junco, very striking bird. I hear these called snowbirds. People, people really see them when there's snow on the ground and they come to feeders and they've been nicknamed the snowbird. Now we're going to look at the chickadee. We're going to listen first. This is the chickadee. Uh, turn your sound up again, and I will quit talking now when I play the video. Okay, so you've had time to use your sound turned down. They were there in the first half. You know, I think I'm holding still when I'm doing this video, but it looks like I've been eating uh, fermented pyracantha and juniper and cedar berries because I was wobbling around badly. The birds were there. You just couldn't see them, but boy, you sure could hear them. Uh, that's the black cap chickadee. I thought I had a picture of one, but I do not. Uh, so this is the Carolina chickadee. Uh, you listen, it's a much longer, it goes D, 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 indicating it's a Carolina rather than a black cap. Oh, I know what we got going on here. We'll shift over to here. I put a red circle where the, um, roughly where Fort Smith State Park is. It's right there. Uh, we're pretty good distance away from the quote <clears throat> zone of overlap. But as Dan George says, Birds do not respect the boundaries that we draw for them. And so we're close enough that, that it could be a mixed bird or a uh, uh, bird.
bird that's mimicking uh, another bird. But as you can see, um, uh, there it is. So talking about the bird real quick, uh, Carolina chickadee, uh, 3.9. So call it four inches to four. 0.7 inches long, grayish nape of, neck, nape of the neck, grayish edging on the secondary feathers. Uh, Scott, you want to pull up a picture of one real quick? Because I meant to put one in here and did not. Uh, the bottom of the bib is well-defined, uh, the bib being the black patch under their beak. And this is the... Carolina. Carolina. Chickadee. Chickadee. Yes, sir. Chickadee, dee, 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 dee. Uh, song is higher pitched and varies up to six notes. Uh, it's a tiny bird, very small, short neck, has a large head, long, narrow tail. The black cap, black bill, and black bib are its most prominent features. And the dark eye is fully within its black cap. Has a very prominent white cheek patch. Very acrobatic, very inquisitive. Easily attracted to feeders with sunflower seeds, peanuts, and suet. Very social bird. Travels in mixed flocks. There we go. Very beautiful bird. Uh, it will use nest boxes and tubes. Uh, habitat is forest, urban, suburban yards, parks with large trees, open areas, and forests. And that wraps up the show for me, show for me. sitting here uh, i have not added in a closing pretty bird or pretty flyer of another species so that yeah, wraps up the show share your screen if uh, if you have anything else. no nope, don't have anything else that's it all right so okay. uh next week we'll be looking at more of carl bernhardt's uh submitted pictures and a couple other people i've got a couple from we really want your pictures we the show is made by pictures and get out there and shoot pictures. The reason I put in pictures that I took, I wanted to help help illustrate that, you know, I'm using a smartphone and a pair of binoculars, right? I'm not out there with a big Nikon or Canon and a 600 millimeter wildlife lens and, you know, sitting in a blind for two days waiting for the bird to come by. Although that does attract me to certain points. Um, I'm making do with what I've got and getting decent pictures and good sounds of the birds. Um, I'd like to get better at cedar wax wings and things like that, but, but it is what it is. And, you know, to the idea that I held up my phone to a pair of binoculars and got a decent picture of a bird, I, you know, I'm proud of that. And so Ken, are you using the apps on, on your phone to help identify the birds or uh, so far? I went with other people's birds when they send them in, I will yeah. do that. And I'll also look up in my, uh, trusty, National Geographic Field Guide. Yeah. As right. well. And the Bible, have, huh? It's yeah. it's one of the Bibles. I've got a couple other bird books uh that I'm using as well to cross-reference, but that's what I'm doing. And, and you know, not that I don't trust everybody else's IDs, it just helps when somebody somebody else says, Yeah, that's what that is, right? And sort of <laughs> makes it you know, a little bit of confirmation. So Harold Locke um, says, Kent, your bird calls, it seems have set off the birds in all of my area. Oh, <laughs> all excellent. Of my area. Excellent. That's, That's awesome. Cool. And Beatrice says, I'll send you some pictures, Kent. The, la uh, the, the last week I couldn't find them, but I promise you, you'll get some now. So, awesome. So, so Scott, yeah. go ahead and post in the chat, the email address for if there's any new, new viewers out there. It's Explore okay. Alliance at ExploreScientific.com. Sure. Scott will give you that in the chat so you can copy it and send me your pictures. Now, I love the stories as well. Yeah, send me pictures, but if you have a story about the bird, like uh, uh, Carl had a towhee he had a few weeks ago that he had put up everything, was getting in his, in his car or vehicle, and looked up, and there was this bird sitting feet from him on this rock, and he grabbed his camera, got a couple of pictures, <laughs> and had this beautiful picture of this towhee, which, you know, well, that's a lucky shot. Yeah, he, it was a lucky shot because he made his luck. One, he was out there taking pictures. Yeah. He had his gear and he knew how to, how to use his gear. So when the opportunity appeared magically before him, he was able to exploit that. And he mm -hmm. got some pictures of some uh, acorn woodpeckers uh, that he sent me yesterday, I think, that are fabulous, really close ups. I said, I asked him, I said, how far away from those birds were you? And he said, 
within feet of the birds. Uh, they were in a park setting and very uh, comfortable with people. And he said it was like they were almost posing for him. So we'll be seeing those uh, in the future as well. I also got video Monday of this week, uh, was out uh, about sunset and a stream of, I call it a river of black birds. I'm not saying they were all black birds, but they were black birds all flying east uh, to roosting areas. And it was 200 feet wide and at the speed birds fly. And it went on for about 20 minutes. And it's an, it was an astounding number of birds. I will show that video next week. Uh, I'm sure you know people in the United States have seen these, especially in the South where they flock. And I mean, it, it is truly, hun has to be hundreds of thousands of birds. I may try and count how many birds there are, get a steel frame and count how many birds there are and just estimate how many birds flew by me in this constant undulating river of birds going through the sky. So that's awesome. Anyway, um, I I'm really enjoying the show, doing the show, because it's making me think about something I hadn't really been into before. My parents, when we were kids growing up, I think I've said this before, we would go out on a Sunday drive when those were still a thing back in the 60s and, and early 70s. Uh, and one of the things was bird watching. You know, and I could remember my mom getting so excited when she saw a painted bunny, you know, or, uh, you know, a big pileated woodpecker, you know, but, but the painted bunny and the indigo bunny would just make her so happy. And um, it's really cool. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the show because of that. It's, it's opened me up to another hobby that is, you know, very, you know, going camping, you can do bird watching. Going fishing, you can do bird watching. Uh, you go to a star party, you can do bird watching during the day. Sure. You know, so it is very. It's something that's very conducive to other things. Like I umpire a lot of baseball. Last fall, after we started the show, I'm out there on the baseball field, and I'm listening to bird sounds from the nearby trees. Going, oh, I, what's that? Oh, you know, and. Uh, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. You can do it anytime you want to. It's pretty awesome. So anyway, who else we got on the show? Scott, any shout outs you want to do there? Well, yeah, let's give everybody a shout out first off here. So thanks to everybody who's chatting and not chatting. Um, we can only see the people who are chatting here, but uh, we got uh, uh, Billy Zastro, Mike Wiesner, um, Chris Larson, um, Norm Hughes, um, Jim Norwood is watching. Beatrice, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, Wade Prunty is watching 100 mile per hour or not, not 100, 100 hour Wade. That's right. 100 hour Wade. Yeah. 100 mile per hour uh, is Caesar. That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, who else do we got here? Uh, Lubo in China. Lubo, thank you for watching all, all the way from China. I mean, that's a. So it's going to be, what time is it in China? So they're, what, 12 hours? It's got to be early, right? Well, Lubo, mm -hmm. tell us what time. Okay, in Peking, it's 6.15 a.m. in Peking. 6.15, okay. So yeah. you get, he's an early riser. Uh, uh, yeah, there's only one time zone for all of China. Uh, amazing. You know, it's such a big country, and there's only one time zone. I wonder how many time um, zones are actually in... I'm going to look up how many degrees of uh, longitude. It's it's a big chunk. <laughs> it is. I mean, if it, in the United States, we've got, what, four time yes. zones, something like that? In the so. continental United States, yes. Right. Uh, 60 degrees of latitude. So, uh, so they're, what, 15 degrees apart? So five Long time zones. Longitude or latitude? They're, they're five time zones. Five. Yeah, but they don't have five time zones. Right. They've got one. They, yeah. they, they operate on a Mayo time as yeah, a yeah, chairman yeah. Mayo. So you have to wake up at uh, uh, Mao, not Mayo. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mao, not Mayo. Oh. Chairman That's Mayo. Right. That sounds like a, 
That sounds like a Chinese it's like mayonnaise. the clinic, right? It's like or Chinese mayonnaise, Chairman Mayo. Yeah, Cha- Chairman right. Mao. So yeah, it doesn't matter if you live, and I suspect they operate on east their their eastern time zone would be my guess. But anyway, yeah, that oh, covers actually and, uh, covers. Uh, a guy named Powell. Uh, he says hello from Poland. Bad weather in Poland, and I just can't. I can't with good weather. Uh, can't maybe w- oh, wait uh, for good weather. About um, uh, with my weather is asleep. Yeah. So <laughs> my telescope is asleep. Scott, I used to I used to explore scientific five X Barlow lens. Best Barlow, thank you. Uh, best great view in of the moon. And very sharp structure. Uh, can't wait for the good weather. Who's that? Yeah, thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Who was that from, Scott? Uh, his name is Powell. Maybe Pavel. It's P A W E L. Powell or Pavel. And the last name is L E C H. Cool. So uh, it's midnight. It's midnight in, in Poland. So yeah. they're, they're GMT plus one. All right. So. And, um, you know, Richard Grace is watching. Martin Eastburn's watching. Hey, Scott, uh, I've got a call I've got to take. Been waiting for all day. I'm going to drop off. See you, okay. everybody. Bye. All right. Well, we will see you guys tomorrow. Uh, I'm focused on astrophotography with uh, Tyler Bowman. And uh, certainly we've got Annie on and whoever else that Tyler's got lined up. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And um, until that time, you guys keep looking up. Take care. Thank you.